Well, good morning. Are you excited this morning? Are you excited this morning? Absolutely. Okay. Can anybody tell me what we're talking about? Joshua 20. Joshua 20. Where got that one? I've been studying We've been talking about it for a long time. We actually got to the end of the slides. I need to be to the beginning of Oh boy, it looks like a really long sermon. <laughs> Man! Oh, you guys are in for it. <laughs> and it's on repentance. Oh, yay. We all need to So we're talking about the cities of refuge, right? In Joshua chapter 20. And how everything in the Old Testament is just a beautiful picture of Jesus Christ. And to really understand the things that God is talking about in the New Testament, sometimes we need that picture. I'm the kind of person, who, who was the one in school who, if they gave you a book on how to rebuild a carburetor, you were like, yeah, I don't. I, I read six pages of this and halfway through it I was somewhere in another land. <laughs> But if they showed me the carburetor, I was like, oh, I get it now. And, and, and in my brain, I have, to, I have to know why something does what it does. Remember when those lamps came out and you touched them and they just got brighter and shut yeah, off? Yeah. Oh, that. I had to take, buy it, bring it home, take it apart, figure out exactly what it was that was making that do that. Because I could not function until I understood that. And so sometimes I need God to paint me a picture of what he's talking about. And Joshua chapter 20 does that. It's basically, they've settled the promised land, and then because they didn't have a police system or anything set up, they said, okay, we're gonna make these safe cities where if you kill somebody by accident, we use the illustration of the ax head flying off and hitting somebody in the head, remember? It was Michelle. Michelle got killed. Cliff was the one who did her. Did good. Did killed her. And and then Ranch was the one who chased him around. He was the Goel, right? Okay, so we actually saw an, a physical representation of that. So now we see these cities of refuge set up throughout the Promised Land. There were six of them, three on each side of the Jordan River. They were all within approximately 30 miles of each other. So if something happened, you need to run to one, you knew you were within 30 miles of that city. So the first sermon we did was, if you went to the city, you couldn't go to the city and put one foot in and keep one foot still out. Mm -hmm. Some of us try to do that with God. Mm -hmm. Because... The, the revenger, the seeker of blood was like, you're going to keep one foot outside of that city? I got you. You need to be 100% in the city. And once I'm in that city, huh? go well, you can't get me. I am safe. I am safe from the destroyer, the person who is coming to kill me. It's a picture of God's grace. The second sermon we did was from the viewpoint of the Goel, the seeker of revenge. And how once they got in that city, was it just unfair that they got away? But God says revenge is mine. And then we got into forgiveness. And that was just, it was a wonderful morning. I can always tell when people come up and they say, boy, the Lord is, uh, spoke to me on that one. I got some things in my life that I want to I wanna deal with. And that's Pastor Bob, you know, when, when somebody comes and tells you that, you're like, okay, that's, those are the things I like to hear. I, when somebody comes and says, oh, you're an eloquent speaker, I've never actually heard that, but <laughs> <laughs> those are not the things. I want to hear how it's changing your life. So, third, last week we did the sermon. Once you're in that city, you're secure. When you walk around in the city, you say, Oh, it's because of how good I am. My good sins outweigh my bad, so that's why I'm safe in this city. No, it had nothing to do with you. Nothing at all. 
You were safe and secure in that city because of the grace and blood of Jesus Christ. So, now, today we're going to read where it says, once you got to the city, you had to confess. You got to the city gates and you confessed. So you went to the city gates. You didn't just step into the gates, but the priests would meet you at the doorway of the city and you would tell them, I did this. Now, and then they actually made a decision. So if you got to the city gates and you're like, I didn't really do it, I'm innocent, but I just want to come in. They might be like, well, this isn't the deal for you then because this city is set up for true repentance. When you come to the city gate, you need to really repent and tell us what you did. And then you're going to find that refuge. That's kind of what we're going to get into today. And next week, one more week on Joshua 20, the Lord's kind of promised that to me. It's going to be a city of acceptance. Are we a church that accepts anybody? When they walk through the door, will they tend to not walk through this door because they think, I'm not going to fit in. I'm too bad. I'm not good enough to get in there. No, that wasn't the case. They stepped in the city and then they accepted it. But that's next week's sermon. Is really being accepted and making sure that as a family of God, we represent that to the people in the world. So, but now once you enter the city, well, this was the law that they practiced, the Goel, we went over that. And we know that Jesus is the city. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. So now the out could be possibly one more sermon, but I think we're going to move on. Because there is more to that, because it has to do with the high priest. Once the high priest died, you could go out. Jesus was our high priest. So his death on the cross now allows you the freedom to move around, but you're still under the blood of Jesus Christ. But he is the door. John 10, 7. Then Jesus said to them again, most certainly I say to you, I am the door of the sea. So Jesus Christ is the safe city. He is the entrance by which you get into that safe city. You have security in the city once you get there, and we covered that. But once in the city of the Lord, we want to go further up and further in. That was one of C.S. Lewis's famous quotes. It's all through the books of Narnia. There's actually a play about his life, and it's called Further Up and Further In. So, in Philippians 1.6, it says, He who has begun a good work in you will complete it. Does that sound like an ongoing process? It does. He who began a good work in you will complete it. So there's a beginning and there's a completeness. So we are in this process of growth. And that's kind of what I want to talk to you about today. So once you enter the city, you are God's children. To them, he gave the right to become children of God. So now we're in Joshua 20. The Lord also spoke to Joshua, saying... Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Appoint for yourselves cities of refuge, of which I spoke to you through Moses, that the slayer who kills a person accidentally or unintentionally may flee there. They shall be your refuge, refuge, refuge from the avenger of blood. So we have an avenger of blood who is after us on this planet. And when he flees to one of those cities, and stands at the entrance of the gate of the city and declares his case in the hearing of the elders of that city, they shall take him into the city as one of them and give him a place that he may dwell among them. So see the underlying part. Stands at the entrance of the gate of the city and declares his case in the hearing of the elders of that city, they shall taken into the city. So about 30 years ago, there was a group of people who started a belief called Free Grace. The group taught that faith alone 
was the only condition for salvation. Nothing new there. We believe in that, faith alone. However, there was a twist to their belief system. And you know, Satan in the Bible, it says, will come to you as an angel of light. So we picture Satan coming with a pitchfork and evil and all of that. But actually, the Bible talks about Satan coming to you as a wonderful messenger, a beautiful thing, with just a slight twist. Like maybe Jesus was just a prophet. He was a good man. Without that, we lose the whole entire gospel story. So if anyone ever tries to tell you that, stay far away. If anybody ever tries to tell you that it's just faith alone and not repentance, stay far away. That was the twist to the free grace movement. Repentance is not a condition for salvation. That's what they said. Repentance should be never included as part of the gospel message. That's what they said. Do we see this in the world now? When people are just immersed in sin and they're standing in a group of Christian, Christians and they say, well, your Bible says not to judge me. I'm a Christian, but I can believe how I want. Well, no, there is steps of repentance in our Christian walk. But what I want to point out today is there's two different steps of repentance. There's a step that I get in the city and has nothing to do with anything of myself. I just come to the city gates. I say I'm a lost sinner. I step into the city, and now I'm safe and secure in that city. But then God says, I want to complete the work that I started in you. So now there's going to be more steps in your life. Sometimes the Bible talks about the steps that we take to grow closer to the Lord when it comes to repentance. Sometimes the Word of God is talking about the step we took to become saved. They're different, folks. And sometimes, and I've heard it, if somebody doesn't know their hermeneutics or apologetics, they confuse the two. And then you feel like every Sunday you got to get to that altar to be saved. So... This free grace movement, it's not right. The, one of the very first things that anybody talks about when they preach the gospel is repentance. That's the first step. Remember how many times we brought Dave up and we said, do you obey the Ten Commandments? And finally, that's the Ten Commandments is the first step. Realizing there's no possible way I can live ten minutes of my life without breaking God's law. So that's when, and then we went through the Beatitudes, the broken, like when you realize, I am nothing without Jesus Christ. I need him in my life. That's the first step. <coughs> and we come and we say, I am <coughs> desperate for the sanctuary, the protection of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the first step. So. Let's look at repentance. The first word of John the Baptist's ministry. So if you say, well, it's not part of preaching the gospel, then how come it was such a big part of John the Baptist's ministry? Remember him? He's the one that came and announced Jesus Christ. Look at Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. And it says, in those days John the Baptist came, in Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the judgment of Judea, saying, what's the first word? Repent. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Not only is the word repent the dominant thing in his message, but he made it absolutely clear. I mean, John the Baptist went on a serious mission of getting people to repent. And it ended up with his head on a platter. And also, and so John came baptizing in desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So there we are in Mark also. How about repentance being the first word of Jesus Christ's ministry? When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, John the Baptist had been put in prison, 
he returned to Galilee. And from that time on, Jesus began to preach what? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now I'm talking about the repentance that you need to enter into the city of God. That is your salvation. It's your security. That's what we're still talking about. Okay. Let's get into repentance a little bit. Jesus preached repentance. It's all through the Gospels. Repent is an action word. Do you remember in school? They'd be like, what is this? A noun, a verb, an adjective, and I just, I don't know. I, I'm not good at this stuff. You know, the, remember when they were like, what's the plural of, of this verb or that word? Or this? And you're like, I, I don't know. Like, what's the plural of ox? And you're like, oxes? No, no, oxen. Okay, now what's the plural of box? Oh, boxing. <laughs> no. I just was like, I can't do this. But repentance generates certain things. It's an inward work that has an outward fruit. Drastic change results from repentance. Repentance involves changing one's mind in a way that affects some change in a person. And it alters your life. With repentance, you can't stay where you are. With repentance, you can't keep going where you were planning on going. With repentance, you can't keep talking the way you were talking. With repentance, you can't think the way you were thinking. With repentance, you can't keep doing the things that you were doing and acting the way that you were acting. If repentance is done, it works in the heart. And the fruit of repentance will manifest itself in your life. It prepares the way for the faith that takes you to heaven. Repentance prepares the way for faith to take you into a deep relationship with God. So, what we're going to do here today, we're going to look at two verses. They both talk about repentance. Okay? We're going to see the two differences of what I'm talking about. The repentance of you stepping into the city and the security that you have nothing to do with besides repenting. And then, later on, we're going to see First Paul talking about you're saved, you're saved, not by works. And then James going, if you're saved, you're going to sow some fruits. Okay, so let's get to the first one. Romans, now to him who works, that's us. If we're trying to work out our salvation, the wages are not counted as grace, but debt. In other words, there's nothing we're doing. But to him who does not work, but believes on him, capital H, Jesus, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. So in other words, the one who gets in the city, nothing they did. None of their goodness. Remember last week we said on your very best day, when you wake up and you think, man, I haven't swore, I haven't had a bad thought, I haven't acted in anger, I haven't gossiped, I haven't even thought about the things that I could say if I was allowed to, our righteousness is still as filthy as rags. Yes. It's only through the blood of Jesus Christ that makes us clean, makes us pure. Okay, so... So that's what Paul is talking about here. All right. So, in the city has nothing to do with what we did. But then, all of a sudden, we read in James. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Oh man, what on earth? James 2.26, for the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. You know, back in the day, theologians used to preach this as James and Paul were literally in a fight, in an argument. They literally said, the two didn't agree on this, and they were fighting within the Gospels. 
an atheist or something, right on that. It's a contradiction. Well, if it's the word of God, how are two guys fighting about what they're writing? So we have to squelch that right now. They're talking about two entirely different things. In Romans, he's talking about you coming to the Lord from the world. In James, let's, let's read this again. Let's just get this right. I want you to see something. What does it profit? Everybody reading with me? What does it profit my that word? brethren? Wait a minute. Say it again. Brethren. One more time. Brethren. Who's he talking to? Us. Us. He's talking to Christians. Paul's talking to unsaved people. James is talking to Christians. Big difference, folks. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. So we see James. So it's not a giant contradiction. Paul's talking about entering the city. The beginning of the process. It's free grace. It's given to us. So Paul is talking about sinners becoming saints. James is talking about saints looking saintly. Right? Paul, how to get from earth to heaven. James, how we live heavenly when we're on earth. That's good. Paul, how we're justified and made right with God. James, how do we look when we've been justified and made right with God? Remember when Jesus told Peter in John 13, 1 through 17, I need to wash your feet daily. So there is repentance when we come to the Lord, the initial repentance to step in the city. But then once we're in the city, we need to have Jesus wash our feet daily. What if it doesn't happen? What if we fall into sin? What if we really mess up? What if we say, well... I think I beat that sin, but now this new thing showed up. And then I fell into this, and while I was in that, I went back to that. Paul literally said, the things I don't want to do, I do. So does that mean that we are in and out of the city constantly? No, we're in the city. But one is talking about our growth in Jesus Christ, and the other was talking about how we got in that city. Can you say amen? amen? Every now and then I just need to hear that. <laughs> so could it be possible to confuse the two? Yes, it can. Paul says coming to the Lord starts with repentance and ends with grace and nothing more. Our daily walk involves repentance, but that repentance bears fruit. That's what James is saying. So with that in mind, we need to understand our daily walk with repentance. So we've all failed, we've all sinned, we've all messed up, we've all missed our mark, we've all went the right way, we went the wrong way. But I really want to talk today about really knowing what repentance is when it comes to our growth every day with Jesus Christ. So now, everything I talk about now is not going to be about the moment you came to Christ. But everything I'm going to talk about now is when Jesus came and he says, I need to wash your feet every single day. Are you ready? I would like to scream this so loud. This is the verse in my life that makes, I can't tell you the difference. Repentance is a response to God's kindness. Amen. Repentance is a response to God's kindness. God's kindness leads us to repentance. You say, well, pastor, that's a really nice little nursery rhythm thing you got going on there. But it's not true. It's hellfire and brimstone. That's how people come to know the Lord. Your kindness thing, that's really nice, but you need to show me that in the Word of God. All right. <laughs> Romans 2, 4. Or do you show contempt for the riches of His kindness, forbearance, and patience, not really, not realizing that God's what? Kindness. Not realizing that God's what? Kindness. One more time. Not realizing that God's what? Kindness. Is intended to lead you to repentance.
repentance. Amen. God's kindness, folks. What is God's kindness? It's his faith. It's his peace. It's his love. It's his faith when we're not faithful. He is. It's his peace. It's his love. That's what draws people to repentance. So when people come at me and they say, oh, Pastor, you're all this love. You talk about love too much, about God's love. If every breath of my life was to breathe that for the rest of eternity, there wouldn't be enough time to talk about God's love the way that it should be talked about. You want to see true repentance? Have somebody come to God because of God's kindness. Yes. When we feel bad, when we fail, we feel bad for sometimes letting God down. And people come to me and they tell me that. And I'm like, you can't let God down because you were never holding him up. You don't do that. That's not part of what your job is as a Christian. We give in and we feel guilty. Then we have this inner resolve of, I don't want to do that again. Then we fail and we feel guilty again. And this is when we have to lean on Paul's words in Romans. That is not out of us, but it's through him. Amen. But then we see the verses in James and we say, okay, Lord. There's a big difference between wanting to repent because of God's kindness or wanting to repent because we feel that we were just shoved out of the city of refuge. Two entirely different emotions, two entirely different ways of thinking about it. I told my wife, I said, when I did this this morning, I have something that I wanted to read. I keep a journal. And I have not done this ever, ever before, mostly because I have kind of goofy, random thoughts. <laughs> but I copied this out of my journal. And again, kind of starting out in ministry and listening to the Hellfire and Brimstone sermons every Sunday, and then trying to go through the gospel, trying to see where did Jesus talk like that? When did he say, hey, you better get right or you're going to burn? So, this is out of my journal. I'm... There is no moment in my life that is more extremely wonderful than the moments I have rolled up in God's love like a warm blanket and just cry tears of joy because I'm overwhelmed by my Jesus' compassion and mercy in my life. I am safe, secure, taking part in something the human mind can't comprehend. I want to cling to the edge of his robe like it is my very existence. There is no sin, lust, ungodly thought, or process that has ever left me in a place I actually long or want to be. Most of the time, these things bring me to moments of fear, regret, and emptiness. Now, this is where it gets a little, a little personal for me and understand what I was going through based on my past. If I meet a God, and I did this with a small letter G, if I meet a God that says, get right or burn, I have no interest in him, small letter H. I find myself shaking my fist at him, small letter H, and yelling, okay, God, bring it on. I find myself angry at a God who would force me to serve him or suffer and burn eternally. Now, that's just my rambling thoughts coming forward. But then I wrote, but when I am immersed in God's love and kindness, I find myself on my knees repenting in a way that reveals parts of my soul that only God could see. I find myself repenting because of his love and his kindness. And he loves me back unconditionally, even though every fiber of my human side says that that's impossible. But he does. And it's only as I say, here I am, Lord, take all of me, this mess that I am, that I am immersed in his wonderful arms of grace. 
I've actually told people, when you find yourself in moments of struggle, when you have moments of victory, write it down in journal. Because you can go back and look back, and when those temptations come, you'd be like, hey man, been there, done that, been to that circus, rode that pony, don't want it. Because <laughs> it says right here in my journal, that's, that's, that's how I want to be. Whew. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? If you ask for it, God's going to give it. So, repentance is in response to God's kindness. Now here we get into James. Repentance should have fruit. So if you say, if you're here today, and you're telling me, I'm not sure I'm showing that fruit. You're here today. <laughs> you're listening to God's words. You're submitting to the music, the songs of worship, the word of God. You're here today. That, in itself, is an act of repentance. If and you probably knew I was preaching on repentance because I said it last week, although I know no one listens to me, so probably happens you don't. <laughs> However, you knew today it was coming. So, you're still here. That in itself is an act of faith. It's stepping out. Repentance is going to have fruit. In Acts 26, 20, it says, First, to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, and all of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, I preach that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. I have to tell kind of a funny story, and it's, it's a moment that God really hit me with something. When I was in like 11th grade, I heard somebody walk up to somebody else and they said, like in greeting, two guys, hi, how's it hanging? And for some reason I thought, oh, that's a kind of a neat way of saying things. And I started going around greeting people that way. <laughs> Until one day, about three or four weeks later, a person walked up to me and they said, I didn't think people like you said stuff like that. <laughs> and right away I thought, oh no. Oh no. Does that mean what I think it means? And I was on a school bus. Oh. And had an absolute, like, just moment of, Lord, I <laughs> repent, I repent, <laughs> I am so sorry. Sometimes God shows you stuff. I had no idea what it meant, but when I did, I was like, Lord, there's not enough toothpaste on this planet to bring back the stuff that I said. <laughs> But see, those are those moments in our Christian walk. When I said that, did I step out of the city? No. So I didn't even know what it meant when I was saying it. However, there are times when I do know this, this is going to cut to the bone, but I'm angry and I'm letting self take over. And then later on, it's like, Lord, God, I should not have said that. <laughs> But here it says, they will demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. So again, he's not saying your deeds are what save you. But he's saying once you're saved, you're going to show some fruit. That's right. You're going to show some fruit. Whew. Repentance should be extreme. What are you doing? To start to recognize the things of God. 
Are you setting up, are you minimizing your triggers in your life? Are you setting healthy boundaries? Are you confessing sin? Are you turning to God? Are you praying more? Are you reading the word more? Are you fellowshipping more with people in a body of Christ? When these things happen, you know what else happens? You start to see spiritual warfare more. You start to realize, oh, hey, you know what? This argument I'm having with my spouse, there's some spiritual warfare going on. This is not because of indigestion or something else. Some things are happening. These things are growth. And it should be extreme, extreme. Matthew 5.30 says that if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now, is he, we're not talking literally, cut your hand off. But I'm going to use my buddy Cliff back there. Can I, can I pick on you, Cliff? So Cliff is, Cliff is studying to be a chaplain. In order to do that, he has to become a pastor in the Assembly of God Church. So we're going to be hearing from Cliff. He's got quite a journey. Eventually we're going to be interviewing him because I want you guys all to know him as he takes some of these big steps. But you know what he told me the other day? He got a flip phone. <laughs> yeah, he got a flip phone. And I said, really? What, what is that? And he goes, because I'm just too tempted to look at a phone with internet on it. So I'm just going to get a flip phone. And now I don't have that temptation in my life. Hey, Cliff, that's a... That's a... That's amazing. Like that is a... That's a big step. That's what he's talking about here. This should be extreme. When you see things in your life, what measures are we taking to cut lusts, anger, greed, gossip, sexual immorality, immoralities, and things out of our life? Again, we're talking about growth, not salvation. How about this? In Proverbs, I know Brian's working through Proverbs, where it says, For the lips of an adulterous woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. She gives no thought to the way of life. Her paths wander aimlessly, but she, but she does not know it. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Do not turn aside from what I say. Keep to a path far from her. Do not go near the door of her house. So we're talking about sin here. It's a, you can use it allegorically, but it's talking about sin. Sin is going to draw you to it. But what did it say? Keep a path far from her, but do not go near the what? The door. The door. So here's something. Here's something drastic you can do in your life. Just avoid the door. If there's sin... If there's something in your life, a substance, an addiction that's pulling you towards it, sit and pray, Lord, okay, I want to stay far away from that, but not only do I want to stay far away from that, but I want to stay far away from the door to the sin. What's easier to walk away from? What's easier to reject when it comes to temptation? The temptation itself or the door to the temptation? The door. Once you're standing in front of the temptation, it's pretty hard to turn away from that. So that's just a little example of something extreme that we can do to turn away from the things that Satan wants to put in our life. So remember, repentance, number one thing, is a response to God's kindness. If somebody ever says to me, you know, preaching up hellfire and brimstone, that's my verse. Repentance should have fruit. Repentance should be extreme. Jesus is talking about our life as we grow and move more in the things of God. There was a missionary, and he returned after many years of service and was asked by someone else, tell me what you have found when you arrived, and he was from New Guinea. Tell me what you found when you arrived in New Guinea. And he said, found? I found something that looked more hopeless than if I'd been sent into a jungle of tigers. Well, what do you mean, they asked him. 
Why the people seem utterly devoid of moral sense. If a mother was carrying her little baby and the baby began to cry, she would throw it into the ditch and let it die. If a man saw his father break his leg, he would leave him by the roadside to suffer by himself. They had no compassion whatsoever. They didn't even know what the word meant. Well, what did you do for them? The person asked the missionary. And he said, I thought it best to show them my faith by my works. When I saw a baby crying, I picked it up and consoled it. When I saw a man with a broken leg, I sought to mend it. When I found people distressed and hungry, I took them in. I comforted them. I fed them. And finally he inquired, well, what does this mean? Why are you doing all of this for us? That's what the people said to the, the missionary. Why are you being the way you are? Why are you showing us this compassion? And then he says, it was at that moment that I now knew I had my chance to preach. And they said, did you succeed? And he said, absolutely. When I came home on furlough, I left a thriving, God-fearing church. God-loving, saved by grace church. Amen. Faith, when you're entering the city, needs to make such an impact on the life of a believer that they're changed. The fact that a person cannot remain the same after they find Jesus is an absolute fact, folks. It's an absolute fact. And we get into the whole eternal security thing, where the two sides build their walls. But the one side says, hey, once you're saved, you're always saved. Once you're in the city, and I always, I like to just sit between the two of them and challenge them both. Because <laughs> that's what Jesus did, right? He always, when somebody would ask him something, he would ask them a question. And so when the people are like, you can come in and out of, you can come in and out of salvation. Well, let me ask you this. We're God's children. What do you, what does one of your children have to do to you so that they're no longer your child? Yeah, Kim, what would... If my son kicked me, spit on me, and stabbed me in my dying breath, I would be like, I love you. And that's us. How much more does God love us? But then, I want to also challenge somebody that free will... You're in the city, right? But it says you can't leave the city. So with a choice, somebody could step outside of that city. We think, oh man, that's just daily, back and forth. No, it's not. But we don't have time for that today. But we want to get on... We want to just look at this as when the people talk about eternal security, they say, well... You say, well, look at this person. He's not changed at all. Well, then he was never saved. That's their viewpoint. And there's some truth to that. But once we're saved, it is a fact that our life is going to change. It's a fact. So, do you have something today you want to repent of? As we're just sitting here. When God puts different things in your life and you say, hey, maybe this is something I need to turn away from. I want to teach you a new Hebrew word. Are you guys ready? Yes. My wife rolls her eyes when I do this, but I love the Hebrew words. Because we had to come through, they had to take the Hebrew words and translate them to come up with what the Old Testament said. So still to this day, we're looking at these words and saying, okay, how does this work? And I'm going to do something with you together here. Imon. I know, probably Bob and Kimmy know this, so don't, don't ruin it for everyone. <laughs> Iman. Okay. In Hebrew, the word Iman speaks of something which is sure, solid, and true. That's what it means. Add an ah to it. Imanah. When you do that, it becomes the word imunah, and it's the Hebrew word for faith. So it's 
solid, sure, and true. And then it becomes faith. Something that is very solid, very sure, and very true. It isn't wishful thinking. It isn't unrealistic hoping. It's linked to something that's rock solid, truth. And faith is that by which you join yourself, root yourself, ground yourself to the truth. And the word, Iwana, we eventually turn to Amen. It means a solid agreement. It means so be it, it's going to be so, con confirmation, absolute truth. It means yes, I absolutely submit to what that says. <clears throat> so as we close, let's just read through this. This is going to be Psalms 51. After I read each verse, can you say amen? With the idea of what the Hebrew word is. Solid, absolute, let it be, I'm in agreement with that. Okay? This is Psalm 51, parts of it. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Amen. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Amen. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Amen. <laughs> 10, verse 10. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Amen. Amen. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Amen. Amen. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. Amen. 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 We're going to sing this last song. You know, I just want the word to really bless you today. I want this to be the picture of your salvation. But I also want to call you to repentance. Because these are the things that happen in our life. Repentance makes a difference. Your salvation makes a difference. James, talking about acting like you're part of heaven. Paul's talking about becoming part of heaven. Two entirely different things. Are you sure in your faith this morning? Say amen. 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 amen.